Buddha with a Buddhist. You say, you don't have to seek revenge because karma will get the bastard anyway. <laughs> Please excuse the language, but when I say it like that, you remember it. <laughs> it's just a teaching tool, that's all. <laughs> so you don't need revenge. So that's why we make a choice, no ill will, no revenge. We're not doing this to hurt somebody. And it's also not to make a decision out of delusion, out of ignorance. That is an important thing here because sometimes you know, to make a responsible decision, because you know, we are responsible human beings and decisions they do you know, affect others, they do affect ourselves, they do give different paths. We want to make sort of the best possible path, but we can always work with every path. But the delusion is actually getting all the information and just making sure you're well informed before you make the decision. But the fourth thing, you know, the first one is not personal desire, not ill will, not delusion. The fourth thing is what I just told a few minutes ago, never make a decision out of fear. And that's the most important part of decision making. Because so many people make decisions out of fear. Or they don't make decisions out of fear. And where that fear comes from is a fear of some punishment because they're so afraid of making the so-called wrong decision. And that paralyzes so many people. When I went to that shop to get that catalogue, now I have to make sure, I'm afraid, what if I choose the wrong colour? And all those people have given all this money to the retreat centre, I spoiled the whole retreat centre by painting it pink. <laughs> Oh, what will people say about me? I don't care. Because I always realize whatever I do, I'm always in a win-win situation as a monk. If I make the wrong decision and say something really stupid here and offend everybody, oh, that's brilliant. Then I can stay in my monastery, do all my meditation, I won't have to come to Nolamara ever again. <laughs> I can have a bit of a rest. So when I stuff up, oh, that's brilliant. And if I don't stuff up, that's brilliant too, because I can give a good talk and make people happy. So it's marvellous actually that whatever I do, I realise it's always a win-win situation. It's just a different path in life, that's all. And now this is a true story that you know, I was always thought I was very, very fortunate. When I first came here 25 years ago, after nine years in Thailand, I was number two monk here. I had another monk and I was just like, you know, like cyclists, sometimes they, they, they cycle behind a big truck. You know, so the, you know, the, the truck sort of uh, takes the wind away from them. And that's what I was like, you know, this other monk, he was taking all of the flack for giving good talks or not good talks. And I was number two monk, it was a very easy life. Until he disrobed. Said, what do you do that for? All my plans went to smithereens. But it didn't matter, because I made a decision then afterwards. I said, well, you know, I can have to start giving these talks. So what happens if people don't like me? I give bad talks. I thought, wow, that's really good, and I can just be a hermit monk. And I always liked being a hermit. I always had these fantasies of like going in deep caves. This was my fantasy, because I, when I first came over here, I heard there's some brilliant caves in the Nullarbor. And they've got water underneath as well. So you've got your water, you've got your seclusion. And I'm sure I can get sort of someone to give me some food somewhere. And I thought I'd become like the hermit of the Nullarbor. That was my fantasy. This is what monks dream of. They don't dream of winning the lottery or finding a beautiful girl. They dream of like being a nice hermit in a deep cave in the Nullarbor. But then I started fantasizing further. What would happen next? Can I imagine you know, if you were like a monk and you're staying in a deep cave, say in the Nullarbor, sooner or later somebody will find you. And as soon as they find you, they'll tell, chan tell Channel 9. And Channel 9 would go out there with the reporters to do like, you know, a, a human interest story about the, the hermit of the Nullarbor. You know, why did you run away? Was it because of a broken heart? <laughs> you know, or was, it because, or was it because your business went pear-shaped? Or because some other reason why you just didn't like the world anymore because the eagles kept on losing? Was that the reason why you, <laughs> why you went to be a hermit? <laughs> 
and they, they do an interview and of course it would go on the TV and of course as soon as the TV would go there and they, they tell you, you know, there's a hermit at the Nullarbor and of course all these tourists would start to come and you know, visit you on their way across the Nullarbor plain, the mega diversion to go and see the hermit of the Nullarbor because that's very rare to see like a hermit and so you have all these tour buses coming up to see the hermit of the Nullarbor and then soon they'd have to have like no toilets outside my cave and a, and a little gift shop which has Devonshire teas and before long you get these little dolls of like the hermit of the Nullarbor with a shaky head <laughs> and soon you'd be a tourist attraction just like anything else and that's what happens with the tourist, the hermit of the Nullarbor <laughs> So you see, whatever decision you make, it doesn't really matter. So sort of, this is the way of the world. So I realized that it doesn't matter whatever decision you make to teach or not to teach. If you do teach and you're, you're well received, it was wonderful. If you're not well received, that's wonderful. It was amazing that you had this, this no fear of giving talks. I know people said that that's one of the scariest things to do, is actually to, t to talk in public. To me it's great, because you know, you just relax, if you like it, great, if you don't like it, great. You know, we've got too many people in this room anyway, so the more people I can offend and get rid of, the better. <laughs> Which brings me to today's joke <laughs> about, about decision making. It's actually two jokes in one, I've combined two jokes. About decision making is the second part of it, about this fellow who was, these three fellows were lost in the desert. They've been lost in days. There was a Frenchman, the Australian man, and the Englishman. Because I'm English, the Englishman is going to sort of really get the butt of this joke. So, because you know, I'm English, I can do this. Okay, so the Australian, the Frenchman, the they're lost in the desert for a long time. And they didn't, couldn't find their way out. And then they saw an Eskimo coming in a sled with huskies. And as soon as they found this es saw this Eskimo coming towards them, oh, thank goodness Eskimo, we were lost. You know, we were trying to find our way out. And the Eskimo said, huh, you think you were lost? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's joke number one. <laughs> joke number two. <laughs> was the Eskimo turned out to be sort of a, a, um, a genie, like a, a like a, uh, a magic person and said, actually, you must be very thirsty. He said, oh yeah, we're dying for something to drink. And he said, just to see over there. And it's amazing, there was like three slides going to these big vats. He said, there's three slides there, one for each one of you. These are magic slides. Now whenever you go down that slide, whatever you say, whatever you wish for, that's what you'll fall into. So the first one was the, the Frenchman. So he climbed up the slide and as he went down, he shouted, Champagne! <laughs> and as soon as he said that, he fell into this big vat of champagne. And I was drinking, enjoying himself immensely. It's top quality, vintage champagne. And then the, the Australian, he, you know, he climbed up the slide. And when he was going down the slide, of course, what he said, you know, sort of, <laughs> Well, you know, maybe emu bitter or, or VB or whatever you like. But he said, beer! And as soon as he fell into the vat, it's full of beer. And oh, he's drinking and slaking his first, wonderful. And then the Englishman got up his slide and he forgot what he was supposed to say. In his excitement, he said, wee! <laughs> We can always make something out of your decisions, whichever one wants <laughs> But go, but go, <laughs> go back to the serious part of this talk about decision making. Sometimes when we're afraid of the outcome of our decisions, the fear paralyzes us and often makes us not make good decisions. Now taken seriously now, because sometimes People make decisions maybe about treatment for cancer. And they've got to make a decision. What they're going to do. So how can you make those decisions? Get as much information as you possibly can. So you're not acting out of delusion. Make sure it's not just your personal interest. For example, some people with cancers, sometimes that when 
the chips are down and it looks like you know, there's no treatment available, sometimes they volunteer for experimental treatment. And they do that sometimes not so much for themselves as for the sake of other people. So it's not done out of personal desire, but for the sake of others. And I love that when people do that, things like that. Just a couple of weeks ago, people were talking to me a couple of cases all at the same time about bullying in the workplace. And they were asking me, what should you do about bullying in the workplace? I said, well, it's, you have to make a decision now, whether to report it, whether to leave, to confront the person, or sometimes take it, that's a decision. What decision are you going to make? And I said, one of the wonderful things about reporting bullying in the workplace is you're not doing it for yourself, it's not just for your benefit. Because if there is a person who's exploiting other people in your office or in your place of work, it's not just you they exploit, they exploit someone else and another person. Because it's habitual, it's a wrong way of dealing with the people they work with. And so in such a case, I was encouraging, report it, not for your own benefit, but for the sake of others. It's an act not of personal gratification, but of compassion for everybody else who has to work there. And also compassion for that bully as well, because sometimes they don't realize what they're doing. It's bad karma for themselves, it's bad for the business. And sometimes if it's done in the right way, sometimes that confrontation can lead to some sort of counselling for the bully, so they realise what they're doing, and they can do strategies so they don't act in such a dysfunctional way again. Or at least they lessen what they're doing once they realise the problems they are causing. So I was saying, it's, you're not making this decision for yourself, you're making this decision for other people, out of compassion for others. And sometimes those decisions you make are not just for you, but for the benefit of many other people as well. So when you're making those decisions, it's not done just for you. And when I put it that way, it made so the reporting of the bullies a much easier decision to make, as obviously you can appreciate. If it's just for you, it's a very difficult decision to justify. But if it's for the sake of other beings, you take other beings into account, not just you, other people in the office, maybe your family members, maybe your kids, who are being affected by the stress you feel at work, then it's a decision which is obvious and easy to make. So is it going to be for the benefit of others as well as yourself? And then further, you know, you're not doing out of ill will, not because that person has hurt you and you want to hurt them back. Make sure you're doing it out of wisdom, not out of delusion. When you are facing such a situation, whether it's a treatment for a cancer which is experimental, or reporting, being a whistleblower, are you able, competent, you know, physically and mentally, to actually to cope, you know, with the uh, confrontation, with the mediation, with the talking, with all the other problems which will go on when you're making an accusation like that. Are you physically, mentally able to do that? You know, and sometimes you just, you're too tired, there's too many other things going on, and physically, mentally you're not strong enough to do it, in which case your decision has to be to let it go, to not report. So when you do it with wisdom, finding what is your ability, what can you do? A good example.